Wātea Fifth Estate is brought to you by ACU, the Aotearoa Credit Union. Kia ora Aotearoa, welcome to Wātea Fifth Estate where we wrap the most important news events with the best political panel on television. Joining us tonight for our infamous Friday night political wrap of the week, lead, former leader of the Labour Party, People's Hero and member from New Lynn, David Cunliffe. On the phone, environmentalist and human rights activist Nandor Tanchels. And on the phone, from Otago, political scientist and commentator Dr Bryce Edwards. Thank you for joining us, panel. And remember, viewers, you can send in questions and thoughts for tonight's show off the watianews.com and the dailyblog.nz platforms, or you can email us on watia5e at watia603am.co.nz. Tonight's guest Twitter commentator is the ever-brilliant Laquisha St. Redfern. Follow them tonight using the hashtag Watia Fifth Estate. The top three issues of the week tonight are Issue 1. Key's advice to the homeless. Issue two, National's $3 billion tax cut. And issue three, mass overfishing. And we'll wrap the show with a final word from our panellists, but let's get stuck into issue one. The week began with Prime Minister John Key telling the homeless that if they needed help, they could just pop into winds and get it. The resulting backlash from beneficiaries who were forced to use winds and no first hand Windsor's contempt for their plight managed to make Key's comments seem delusional and out of touch with the draconian welfare reforms that his government have forced through. David, we could laugh all night at how out of touch this comment was. But there are tens of thousands of New Zealanders living in overcrowded situations right now, living in garages or are homeless. I mean... Nobody's laughing. It's, it's, it's an Nobody's obscenity, laughing. isn't it? It is an obscenity. Uh, you know, the, every now and again, something comes along in New Zealand politics which just cuts through all of the nonsense and where the average person can say, that just isn't right. And I think this is one of those moments. John Key is so now seen as arrogant and out of touch. The facts are that if someone m found their way through the maze, that is their local winds office, yes, yes, and yes. talked to a real person for yep. more than two minutes, they might just get a loan to go to a motel, which they would then have to pay back. And if they can't afford a rental in a basic room or a state house, because there aren't any, they sure as hell can't afford a motel. So Mr. Key, you know, charitably, he's out of touch. Actually, I think he's just telling lies again. It's 76 pages to fill in to get a benefit. That, that, that's just the, norm, that's just the normal um, job seeker benefit. Um, 76 pages, most of these people do not have great literacy skills. Do you think that they are purposely dense and making it purposely difficult to get the information out so that people are just, just don't go to wins? The right of politics always creates a situation where to be poor and down on your luck is your fault. Yep. They create moral hazard. That is what they are doing here by layering all of that bureaucracy on top of what is actually the inevitable result of national strategy. Mm -hmm. Look forward to others commenting on this, but it seems to me national wants to keep GDP growth up at all costs. Yep. The price of that is an open tack for non-specific migration. It's not skills focused. Mm -hmm. It's all in. Mm -hmm. And an open sluice gate for foreign investment, some of which is corrupt mm -hmm. and much of which is wasteful. So the result of that is driving up house prices, driving up rents, and inevitably meaning that even people working a full-time wage cannot afford a basic home. Are we, are we looking at the death of the egalitarian dream? Oh, I think it it's, was it's dead, dead and, and buried. I think it? it's dead and buried unless we get a change of government, and then we will bring back the Kiwi dream. But let's just say this. This is one of those moments that taxi drivers talk about in their cabs. Mm. John Key will regret the day that he told people, all you've got to do is go to Winds and it'll be fixed. Because it isn't. Nandor, John Campbell this week highlighted the disgraceful way Winds will charge the poor with substandard motel housing, leaving those desperate enough to use it with thousands of dollars of debt that Winds then start chasing tenants for. Have we ended up how have we ended up with such a counterproductive outcome for the most vulnerable people, Nando? Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's now 
outcome of deliberate policies over many years. I mean, you know, you look at WINS, they've got a long-standing culture of being unhelpful to the mm. people who most need help. And in fact, the High Court, uh, they had to be taken to the High Court and, and told by the court that they were, in, they were obliged to give people full information about their entitlement, and they mm. still refuse to do so. So they have this long-standing culture of being unhelpful. We've got a long history in New Zealand politics of Benny, Benny bashing and this kind of culture of disdain for those who are most in need. And, and you know, that's a, that's a typical tactic of, of the right. Um, and, but to be fair to win, even if they actually wanted to help, yeah. and, and actually um, there are individuals who are, uh, who do care and who do want to help, yep. the reality is, what the hell are they supposed to do when the problem is there's a lack of housing? Right. So it doesn't matter what emergency mm. money you put in or how much you uh, encourage the community mm. sector, the reality is there's not enough housing. And until we've got a government policy of building housing, you know, this problem's going to remain. Because the reality is the market has never, ever been able to provide adequate housing in New Zealand. You know, back to, I think it was after World War I, even before we had state housing, the state was intervening you know, in terms of uh, promoting or supplying low mortgage loans to return soldiers to settle them down yep. you know, and, and lock them into mortgages. So e- even that early on, it's been really clear that the market needed state intervention. And then, of course, with the, uh, the first Labor government and the massive state housing um, you know, projects that, that, that they brought in. But that's the reality, that the market, because the market is about who, making the most profit. Yep. And if you look at the housing the developments that are taking place, they're not building, you know, uh, affordable housing, social housing for low income people. They're building massive mansions for the rich because that's where the money is. Nandor, of the Ministry of Social Development's emergency housing providers, right? 53 are motels, hotels or campgrounds. Only 8 of the 61 are actually emergency housing specialists. What does that say to you? It, it, well, it says to me that this is a ludicrous government that has got no handle on this major issue facing the country. And, you know, John Key's using distraction. Oh, we're doing this and we're doing that. But the reality is there's actually nothing being done in any real sense. And that's why I was really encouraged this week to see the, the Green Party coming out saying about, you know, um, retaining the dividend in, in uh, housing corporation and, and supporting the uh, building of state housing. I've seen Labour's coming out with some policy. So, you know, we're starting to see the opposition uh, coming up with solutions to really address the problem. But the government, well, I mean, and I know it's something that we're going to get onto shortly, but they're more interested in ta- <laughs> more tax cuts from the rent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, 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 will, we will get into that in, 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 a, in a moment. Bryce, Nick Smith told Morning Report this morning that there had always been people living in cars for the 26 years he's been in politics, and Paula Bennett promised 3,000 ghost beds that don't really exist. Are the government out of touch, or are they telling their voters what they want to hear? Well, I mean, I guess Nick Smith's right. I mean, um, we have seen this as a problem for many decades. It's not something new. Um, It's definitely got worse. So that's what we're looking at here. And we had the... um, the head of the Salvation Army saying the homeless situation is the worst he's seen it in 25 years. Mm. So he's not saying we haven't had this problem before. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I would say ever since, especially uh, maybe the the mid 1980s, things got dramatically worse. Um, so they're out of touch, and they've got no real way of. I don't think they've got any way of. Um, genuinely deflecting this and um, I think a lot of national voters will be concerned about this and that's um, why national should be vulnerable they, a lot of you know, yep. interest a lot of swing voters do actually care about this issue and like David says I think it is a, a moment in politics that could resonate and it could well be the the big political issue of the year we've been looking at housing for you know the last few years uh, being a crisis and suddenly we're talking about those at the bottom which are the people most affected by it. So rather than just talking about um, middle New Zealand that are having trouble affording their house yep. and uh, having trouble you know, not being able to live in the most desirable neighbourhoods, now we're actually living, you know, talking about the people that aren't living in structures that are meant to be lived in. They're living in cars, caravans, garages. And I think that does resonate with New Zealand. And they do look at it and they say the system's not working. Bryce, Key is sold via mainstream pundits as moderate. I call it the Dr. Raymond Miller syndrome. But the welfare reforms that have created this situation are anything but. 
Is that why the media seems so surprised at how beneficiaries are being treated? Um, I guess we always, you know, have a lot of conflicting ideas about beneficiaries, especially in the media. Yep. And uh, so, I, again, I'm not sure if there's anything new here, but people, you know, um, do actually believe some of the stuff about um, people on benefits being bludgers, yeah. and they do believe that it's their own fault, but then suddenly they're struck by you know, seeing the reality, because most of us don't actually have that much to do with those that's um, right. That's right. you know, that's at right. the bottom. But then when we see that these people really are living in cars, it, gives mm. us, it shakes us up a bit, I think. Yeah. And it sees that those ideas about bludgers and the, you know, the normal tripe we get you know, from the establishment and from the media yeah. just yep. isn't true. Yeah. So it, it, it does suddenly um, shake some of those assumptions, I think. Thank you, panel. We need to move on to issue two. And in the wake of the housing affordability scandal and the explosion in homelessness, the Prime Minister has hinted at $3 billion tax cuts for the next election. Nandor, the 80,000 children who go to school hungry every day, the 300,000 children who live in poverty and the 20,000 desperately needing social housing will be thrilled at seeing the richest New Zealanders get another $3 billion in tax cuts, won't they? <laughs> well, absolutely. And, you know, this is what happens when you get a million people not sending out the vote at the election and, and, you know, the ones who send out the vote in their interest get their interest and that's what that's what we're seeing is, you know, the government's, uh, it's, well, it's making, it's clearly an election bribe, isn't it? It's mm. making the announcement to its support. It's saying, you know, get us in. John Key, you know, that's his, that's his ambition. I'm, it seems to be has possibly his only ambition is to get another term, be the longest serving prime minister. And, um, you know, well, we, we're going to make the an announcement next year. What what more kind of <laughs> could he have, especially when the government's sold and shows that, you know, they, they haven't got the money, they're going to they're gonna have to borrow it, um, you know, and, and, it's, and the other thing is, you know, the argument, oh, this is about, you know, it's just, it's, it's not actually a, a tax cut, it's just because of the shifting tax bracket, you yep. know, uh, because, we, you know, we're seeing, uh, what do you say, oh, the average income will be... 68,000 shortly and the top cut, the top latest cuts in the 70 and so, you know, uh, you'll soon see the average income earner paying the top threshold. Yeah. So, you know, he, he's been pretty uh, deceptive with figures. My daughter was, uh, came to me with her mass home which she's talking, we're talking about the difference between like medium and mean and stuff like that and if you actually look at the the, the average uh, wage and the median wage, there's, there's about $10,000 difference a year. And, of course, the, the reality is the rich are getting richer yep. and those massive wages at the top end completely distort what the average wage actually looks like. So uh, this argument that, oh, ordinary kind of people are going to be hitting the top income bracket is complete bollocks. Thank you, Nandor. Um, David, uh, $3 billion tax cuts. They're looking to make $5 billion in state house sales. How disgusting is that? That is absolutely disgusting just as it is disgusting that they've been taking dividends from state houses at the same time that we've got people living in, in cars. Mm. But I think on the question of economic management, there are really three key points I'd want to make. The first is that there is an apparent split between uh, John Key and Bill English yep. on the issue of tax cuts. That's weird, isn't Key it? They always out, have this and problem. A, and it's a big question. And for the Prime Minister to come out and say, yeah, we'll do $3 billion of tax cuts mm. in the same week, his Minister of Finance effectively overrode him and said, no, we won't. Yeah. And the feedback I've been getting and we've been getting from the business community is that business is looking to Bill English uh, within the context of the national government to be the sensible, uh, right. secure one. And I think he is losing credibility even in business circles with that sort of thing. I mean, the second issue really is that uh, at very best, National is only uh, minding the shop for today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they are taking absolutely no account of the big changes that are coming at us. Mm. The changes of technology, the changes of, of our climate and, and how that will affect our agricultural base, the demographic changes because of their immigration and other policies, the need to future-proof our education system. This is a government that's looking in the rear view mirror of the mm. car, not out the front windscreen, not with the headlights on. And it's going to run New Zealand up a blind alley. And the third thing I want to say is, look, Nationals borrowed more per capita than any government mm. since World mm. War II. Mm. Labor paid it off. <laughs> we had net debt yeah. equal to zero. Yep. And any suggestion...
that these clowns are good economic managers really doesn't square with the facts. So, how, so, so walk me through that, because I've seen when they sit voters down into rooms and they're handing them out sheets of paper to get their opinions on thoughts, they overwhelmingly come back and say, National is a better uh, manager of the economy, despite all the evidence that that's simply not the case. And so why is it that they don't see Labour or the opposition as being better credible managers of the economy. What is that? Well, let's first think about the system that they run and then think about some things that we can and should do. Yeah. I mean, I often think National runs politics like a business. It's quite simple. They get donations from large vested interests in the door. That allows them to spend a lot of money on daily polling, so they test their yep, lines, yep, yep. on high-priced media consultants and a lot of influence with media outlets. Uh, that means that they get their messages into the minds of the public more often and well-tailored stuff we can do despite that you know in the end it tips and we need to work closely with the Greens and New Zealand First to show that we are a united opposition front that is capable of an alternative paradigm for running this country in the interests of all New Zealanders yep. not just the wealthy not just the powerful but all New Zealanders and I'm confident that we will how much responsibility must the opposition take for not creating that to date well it's a two-step process like it or not, uh, the public started out liking John Key. Mm. They are starting to shift from that. Our mm. internal polling shows That's National right. down to its lowest level pretty much since two elections ago. Yep. This is a tipping point we are approaching. Now, this, so we have to unbutton voters from their historical allegiance mm -hmm. to National, mm -hmm. including some people who sadly voted for Helen Clark and then John Key. Yep. But the second step is we have to present an alternative. And I think you'll see from across the opposition and, and especially from Labour, uh, like our tertiary education policy, mm -hmm. a number of very serious, groundbreaking, uh, alternative policy packages rolled out over the next 12 months mm -hmm. before the hot part of the campaign yep. so the public can see there are solutions there are practical solutions that will work in the real world, and that's what we need to get across. Bryce, the narrative the right always use with the left is that they feed on envy and bribe voters with things like public education and health. What's a straight $3 billion tax cut to the wealthy called? Yes, that's right. I, I do agree with you, but I have to say I don't think there will be tax cuts. I think um, what's been you know, most spectacular from this week in terms of those announcements is that the government are really on the back foot about tax cuts. Right. They've pretty much um, given up on tax cuts for the next two years. And I, I actually doubt that come election time they will feel emboldened enough to, uh, to make that bribe. I think that the narrative has changed and that um, tax cuts are deeply unpopular. And no, so this is a victory, if you like, for the left and for public debate that um, National do want to give tax cuts, obviously, but um, they can see that it would be vastly unpopular and that it's more popular to put it into health and education. So, you know, we, it, what's been interesting is to see the, you know, the right wing commentators, you know, David Farah, yep. and David Seymour, getting really angry this week about this. And, um, and they're quite right. From a, from a right-wing point of view, this government is failing their own side and not giving tax cuts. And uh, kind of, John Key is kind of coming up and saying, well, maybe we'll do it you know, after we're elected next time. Yep. But um, I, you know, what we're really seeing is that the, the left have won that debate. Thank you, panel. We need to move on to issue three. So it turns out, for almost 50 years, the commercial fishing industry may have been illegally dumping anywhere between 20 to 100% of their stock. And the Ministry of Primary Industries seems to have been helping with this, David. So it isn't the recreational fishers who have been the problem all along. What the hell is going on? Well, how do you like the injustice of the fact that if a recreational fisher catch one snapper that's oh, they're a, crucified. a centimetre crucified. under the limit, they're crucified. If somebody dumps... 10 tons of snapper out at sea, nobody seems to care. Look, I used to hold the fisheries that's portfolio. Right, that's right, that's right. I was also Minister of Immigration, yep. and I took a hard line against foreign fishing crews yep. getting visas and fishing for less than the minimum wage. And I can tell you that this is an industry that is deeply corrupt. Yes. I will use that word. That there is all sorts of influence, fair and foul, brought to bear on the Ministry of Primary Industries. I don't believe that uh, General Martin Dunn uh, is anybody who's going to be susceptible to that. And if he keeps digging yep. and he finds the reality of what's going on, I think he will be none too happy. 
But the question is, what have ministers been doing? This is seven, eight years yeah. into a government, and this problem has been obvious and been getting worse, and the opposition's been calling them out. Yep. And now we have an international panel uh, of distinguished scientists uh, doing a study which, even if it was 100% overestimated, yep. still shows such enormous illegal dumping yeah. that the quota management system needs to be stripped down and re-examined from the ground up. And if we wonder why we've got declining fish stocks, there's your answer. Bryce, no government comes out of this very well. How has the fishing industry managed to hide the amount of damage they've been causing to the environment all this time? Well, they've been using the Ministry of the Primary uh, Industries to cover for them, it seems. I mean, maybe I'm being a bit cynical, but, um, but you know, this exercise just shows the bureaucrats in a very bad light. Yeah. And w what I've been interested in is just how no one believes them. So when MPI have come out with their assurances that nothing is untoward, nothing bad is going on, the media don't believe them, the public don't seem to believe them, and everyone has kept up the pressure. So, I, I mean, I think this is a good thing. You know, I think it's good that people are so cynical about, um, you know, when we're told by the so-called experts that nothing's wrong. So, um, yeah, no, there's some pretty red faces, I think, and we will see a good investigation coming out of this, I think. Do you think that we have... I mean, there used to be this perception, and it seems to have gone and chilled very quickly, that New Zealand was somewhere where you couldn't get corruption, that, that corruption was something that wasn't part of our culture. If you look at what the ministry was doing here, it looks like they were letting people off. Why? Yeah, I, I think you're right. There's you know, some big questions about the integrity of the public service here yeah. that um, should be up for challenge. And you know, this is the sort of thing that means people lose faith in uh, government departments. They lo lose faith, faith in politics. Yeah. And um, you know, it just adds up to that cynicism because... Um, <laughs> We don't believe that, um, the, the, well, we think that the powerful, we're starting to think that the powerful do get their way. And that's really, we've got some big players in the yeah. fishing industry. And they've got the, the bureaucrats, you know, around their little finger, it seems. Uh, finally, uh, Bryce, uh, just just need to make the, make the note. Amazing journalism from News Hub, eh? They've really, they really yeah. nailed this one, didn't they? Oh, they have. And, uh, I mean, I would actually give uh, the media quite a bit of plaudits this week for yes. the MPI stuff. The, the housing stuff. The they, domestic violence really stuff and the Herald, they did a good, 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 good piece on that. Yeah, so I think we should take heart yeah. from, um, you know, the media actually investigating and holding, um, holding a, you know, powers to be to account. It's a nice change. Nandor, the earth just broke its 12th straight monthly heat record. It seems we are watching a real-life runaway climate event before our eyes. It seems churlish to focus on the last 50 years of overfishing when the effects of runaway climate warming will decimate what's left remaining of fishery stocks. Are there solutions at this point or just adaptations? <laughs> this is a big question. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I think as always, you know, the, the answer's got to be both. I mean, you know, there's, I think there's probably a number of kind of thresholds that we are going to meet along the way, and uh, some of them are, that's just the reality that we face now. Yep. And that's not helped by the fact that we still continue to make investments in, you know, like David talking about the government looking in the rearview mirror, we're still making investments in old technology, which is going to keep continuing to pump out greenhouse gases and, you know, really taking no responsibility as a nation or as a globe, it seems, for, for what's going on. You know, so, so, I mean, that doesn't help, but I think, I think we will reach these thresholds, so we're going to have to adapt. That's the reality. We, we have to start to look at, you know, what do we need to do to um, bolster what kind of uh, safeguards and, and defences can we put in place? How can we build more resilience into our systems? Because the changes, we've got some idea, but a lot of the changes are unpredictable, so we yeah. have to build a capacity to to deal with the unexpected, and our systems are um, not very resilient at all because resilience relies on strategic redundancy, and we've got this pulse of efficiency that means we've stripped all the redundancy out of, out of everything we can. So we have to rebuild some, um, some resilience into the system. Um, you know, but, but at the same time, we, have, we, have, we still have to play our part because you know, even if we've reached a number of thresholds, it can still get a whole lot worse yeah. if, we, if we still don't act. So... 
yet the reality is we're going to have to take uh, we're going to, have to take some licks that we knew were coming if we didn't change our behaviour. We didn't change. We're going to take the licks. We're still going to have to change our behaviour, or we're going to take bigger licks. You know. Quick, uh, quick final round here before we get on to your final words. What will be leading the news next week, David? What's going to be leading the news next week? I think there'll be more to come on Panama Papers. Mm -hmm. I think there'll be more to come on overseas investment. Mm -hmm. I think it's budget week. Mm -hmm. And so government's economic management, their lack of vision, their lack of a plan uh, will be under a spotlight. And that will be against the background that we have Kiwis living in cars. And that's unacceptable for any Kiwi kid. Bryce, what's going to lead the news next week? Yeah, it's going to be budget week. It's going to be our economics. And the government, I think, will probably come up with a relatively acceptable budget to middle New Zealand. But the lack of anything about housing will be the Achilles heel of that. Nandor, what's going to lead next week? Well, yeah, I think I agree with that. You know, and just going back again to something David said about, you know, this all week that you were talking about, the this perception of the government being these great economic managers and just pulling the rug from underneath that because it's so far from the truth. So hopefully some of that <laughs> might appear. Fingers crossed. We have to wrap the show. Before we go, final word from our guests. Bryce, your final word this week is? I'm starting to think that you guys and Inset Mana were right at the last election about a massive state housing building uh, program. And really, I think that's the only way to solve you know, those that are homeless and this massive problem at the bottom is just to put a huge amount of resources into new state houses. That's very kind of you. Uh, Nandor, your final word this week. Well, I think the, the housing thing is, is, uh, is absolutely critical, but you've got to tie it into um, public transport and those kinds of things as well. You've got to mm. tie it into sustainable housing. How do we build houses that don't continue to suck energy and require these massive inputs? Yep. So, um, you know, we, we've got to start to think in a more integrated way than we have been in the past. And David, your final word this week? It's really hard to pick a tipping point in politics. Mm. Uh, but when you have uh, the mass of Aucklanders stuck in traffic because the city's got too many people and the Gridlock. infrastructure can't Gridlock. cope, uh, when you've got people and children particularly living in cars mm. and tents and garages through the winter, uh, when you have a wet bus ticket uh, waved at corrupt multi-billionaires uh, doing dodgy land deals in New Zealand and unrestrained foreign investment that nobody seems to care what it's about, uh, those things all lead Kiwis to think this is a government on side of the rich that's lost touch with the average New Zealander. And that will lead to a tipping point. Well said. Thank you, panel. And to my final word, in the 1980s, Labour built 10,000 state houses. In the 1990s, National sold 10,000. In the 2000s, Labour built 10,000. Under key so far, we are down 2,000. This is what class war looks like. The surprise by so many in the media at how people are actually being treated by the very departments we believe are there to care is symptomatic of a media that has been stripped of its intellectual depth for shallow clickbait pantomime. The media can't see the class issue in this war. They can't contextualise or critique it because Mike Hosking and Paul Henry's brand of right-wing free market fanaticism drenches every inch of the tiny media landscape we live in. This is social policy spawned by spite and cruelty. We are effectively punishing those whose plight and poverty offends our egalitarian pretensions. We are a country with all the maturity of a day-old can of Coke, so caught up in the false illusion of speculative property wealth. Voters have become willfully ignorant to the desperation of their fellow citizens. We can't pretend to be blind any longer. Thank you, panellists. Thank you, Fano, for watching. We'll join you again Monday, 7 p.m. next week for Watia Fifth Estate. Kia ora and good night. Watia Fifth Estate is brought to you by ACU, the Aotearoa Credit Union.